On behalf of all of us here at Columbia University, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Columbia's Global Centers and a Senior Research Scholar in our School of International and Public Affairs. Today's webinar is organized by our Global Center in Amman, Jordan, from where I am joining you. We are also joined by colleagues, students, and members of our global audiences at our Columbia centers in Beijing, Istanbul, Mumbai, Nairobi, Paris, Rio, Santiago, and Tunis, and at pop-up sites created for our international students during the pandemic in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Seoul, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Tel Aviv, and Athens. We're delighted to have several leading foreign policy experts with us today for what promises to be an illuminating discussion on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East under the Biden administration. From the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C., we welcome Michelle Dunn, Director and Senior Fellow in Carnegie's Middle East Program. With us is David Hurst, co-founder and editor-in-chief of Middle East Eye, a London-based online news outlet covering events in the Middle East. Also joining us from South Africa is Sinan Ulgan, chairman of the Istanbul-based think tank, Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies, and a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe in Brussels. And we have my good friend, David Gardner, international affairs editor at the Financial Times, joining us from Beirut and moderating today's discussion. Three American administrators, administrations since the year 2000 have pursued widely divergent policies in the Middle East, but they all have had one thing in common, wreaking havoc and leaving the region in worse shape than when they took office. George W. Bush's wars on terror were disastrous. Obama's venture into Libya and his subcontracting of Syria to Russia were irresponsible. Trump's deal of the century and the so-called Abraham Accords left Palestinians with nothing to hope for and left Jordan in a precarious position today. At the dawn of this new presidential administration, we are again at an inflection point. Although given the foreign policy legacy of the previous administration, the shifts we're seeing now are likely to be greater than what we've experienced in previous cycles. It is a hornet's nest President Biden would no doubt prefer to stay out of, especially considering what he must contend with elsewhere, from soured relations with Russia and China to troubles at home, ranging from a weakened economy to COVID, to fixing the climate, to ongoing social unrest and polarization. Which begs the question, which issues in the Middle East, if any, will ascend to the top of the White House agenda? Regional disputes connected to the Middle East's most powerful nation states, Iran, Turkey, and Israel, could potentially dominate US foreign policy in the region under Biden, as these countries shape the terrain on which regional politics are conducted. Once the Biden administration establishes its strategic trajectory towards, for example, a renewed nuclear accord with Iran, a more assertive or accommodating stance towards Turkey's ambitions in the region, and a more measured approach towards the Palestinian-Israeli debacle that either tinkers with the status quo or reimagines the opportunities, the specific policy options will become palpably clear, clearer. Trump's foreign policy was characterized by unconditional support for countries in the region considered to be important security partners, namely Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, and the UAE. But the Trump administration's backing emboldened these countries to persist with their policy of foreign interference and domestic repression. Will Biden administration policies condone such behavior? As for Syria, the conflict marked its 10th year last month. Whereas the US passed into federal law, the Caesar Act on December 20, 2019, to promote accountability for the Assad regime's violence and destruction and enhance America's leverage to effectuate change, a ceasefire and a political solution have still not been implemented. What's next on that front? And finally, as if it won't be difficult enough for the Biden administration to reset its priorities in the region, it must first reset its priorities within itself 
The Democrats may be in charge, but the Democratic Party back in Washington is divided on foreign policy matters as left-leaning progressives collide with real politi pragmatists. Which brings us to one of the key questions of the day. Should we expect Biden's Middle East foreign policy to follow that of Obama's strategy of cool detachment within the region, or will there be a departure from it? And might we see deeper and wider engagement? Already, the US has rapidly resumed discrete talks with Iran in an effort to resurrect the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action nuclear agreement that was painstakingly renegotiated by the Obama administration before President Trump's 2018 withdrawal. Official contacts with the Palestinian Authority suspended under the Trump administration were restored shortly after Biden took office. Biden's first phone call to a regional head of state after winning the election was to Jordan's King Abdullah. This stands in stark contrast to his predecessor who engaged with the region almost exclusively through the lens of Gulf and Israeli interests. And as our esteemed panelist David Hurst recently noted, Biden got it right by lending his staunch support to the king immediately following the events of three weeks ago, sending a strong message along the way to sinister regional actors. How will old friends and familiar enemies inside the region respond to a change in leadership? To what extent, if at all, will regional actors accommodate the Biden administration's vision of the region? Even the expectation of a new political order in Washington is enough to cause changes in the reality on the ground. On January 5th, several weeks before President Biden's official inauguration, the Gulf Quartet lifted its blockade on Qatar, which had begun shortly after Trump took office. We are delighted to convene today's panel of experts to discuss these questions and many, many more as it explores what the new administration means for US foreign policy in the Middle East. This promises to be a truly riveting discussion. Michelle, Sinan, David, and David, thank you very much for being with us today and for sharing what you are about to share. David Gardner, over to you, my friend. Thank you very, very much, Safan. The, as you said, um, the Biden administration has huge, huge, huge uh, uh, challenges ahead of it. Um, some of them entirely unforeseeable. I mean, you know, the coronavirus, COVID pandemic, how to get that first of all under control. And then the means by which you, you know, it trills off the tongue build back better, but it's easier said than done. And even people on his own side are, are querying his way of, of, of going about it. Um, it, it. That's just domestic. And with, as you said, the polarization, uh, 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 which shows little sign of going away, the, 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 the question of racial justice, which there has been a, 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 a hallmark uh, uh, case, uh, uh, which we've just seen. Um, and abroad, you know, the challenge of Russia and China, which are testing, you know, they're, 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 they're playing a game in Ukraine, Taiwan and so on. So what, what is this chat made of? But um, it is interesting to me, um, as I understand it, the first, it, this is a double first actually, the, 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 the first, uh, within the first month, uh, Secretary of State Blinken had a conference call with Middle East ambassadors, sorry, US ambassadors to the Middle East. Um, it's the first time that happened. And this was before similar uh, uh, conference calls with other regional groups of, 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 of US ambassadors. Now, what does that tell you? I mean, you know, the, it, it, this is not the first time that, you know, we've seen administration after administration from, from, from George W. Bush through Obama, through even Trump, you know, wanting to pivot elsewhere. But this is a region which keeps 
sucking in policy time, resources, and forces. And that, it seems to me, is unlikely to change. I mean, where, where I'm about to begin uh, uh, with our panelists, which is, I think, on Iran and the, the partial resumption of talks, the head of the US delegation, I think I'm right in saying, Rob Malley, uh, said that in Obama too, you know, despite you know th this this wish to pivot, I mean, seventy five percent of the time spent in the you know White House incident room was on the Middle East. Um, so, um, uh, Michelle Dunn, that you you were once a, a denizen of the White House and the State Department and so on. I mean, you know about this. We have. Um, as, as you were saying earlier, got into this uh, a sort of Biden effect after Trump, uh, an exploration of rapprochement. We have the talks in Vienna, indirect, I mean, Iranians, Americans, different hotels, shuttling going on between them, um, uh, but an attempt to resurrect and, 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 and to, to uh, uh, reinstate the JCPOA, the, 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 the nuclear deal of 2015, which Trump, you know, unilaterally and willfully tore up in 2018. Um, we have parallel to that in Baghdad to begin with, talks and exploratory talks going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The principal uh, 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 antagonists in the, the, these proxy wars that, um, were unleashed, arguably, by, by the Bush administration and the invasion of Iraq, or US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, and actively incited by Trump, particularly after his visit to that summit in Riyadh in 2017, when he effectively called for a Sunni, Saudi-led Sunni jihad against uh, 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 Iran. So we, we have all that. Um, now, I think the first question is this. What would it take to get Iranians and Americans back into the same room? Um, where is the threshold at which they would be able to piece back together something like the old nuclear deal? And given that the Biden administration it, it expressed intent is to involve regional actors, two of whom, Trump's and the US's pr premier allies, uh, uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, profoundly object to the deal intrinsically, but obviously they object to the way in which Iran has uh, built this Shia axis across the region. So, the third part of this question, which I want you all to consider at the beginning of the show, is, is it likely to unfold as, unfold as two chapters? First, the nuclear deal, then the, 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 the rest, the, the militias, the ballistic missiles and so on, or is it likely more to be one sentence with a comma in? Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Safwan. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, so, you know, David, if you will allow me just to say a couple of things in terms of what I think are the broad forces that are going to shape Biden's policy in the Middle East, and then I will come back quickly to the issue of the talks with Iran. Uh, you know, for Biden, I mean, if you if you listen to his statements and those of Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, it, it's really clear that there's an overarching view of um, you know China is the most important issue, and somehow sort of the um, you know the global struggle in a way between authoritarianism and, and democracy and the United States reasserting itself on the world stage to try to 
uh, play a role along with its democratic allies in shaping global norms and, and reasserting the rules-based order, right? We're, we're gonna see this in many different forms. And this is, this is gonna play out in the Middle East as well. Regarding what you said about leaving the Middle East, yes, you know, we've seen <laughs> Biden, like Trump before him, like Obama before him, and even George W. Bush before 9-11 have all said, you know, we need to we have need to have a smaller uh, military presence and spend less diplomatic effort and so forth on the Middle East. So they've all struggled with that. One of the big struggles, I think, now is, you know, how to do that. The Iran deal is part of this. Of course, the threat of nuclear proliferation in the Middle East is an enormous one that cannot be ignored. And there's a sense that that's the priority that has to be somehow cleaned up first. Um, another thing that the, the Biden administration is has turned its attention to in the early days is um, cleaning up what they see as a, a bit of a mess related to the war in Yemen, which frankly the Obama administration started by supporting the Saudi-led uh, intervention there. And now we've seen Biden sort of, you know, trying to complete the process of getting the United States out of that and doing what it can to, to contribute to a diplomatic solution there for Yemen. Um, and we've seen a kind of sorting out, I, I'm sure we'll talk more about um, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, Israeli-Arab normalization agreements. We've seen the Biden administration sorting out a bit, you know, which parts of those from the Trump era is it going to keep and which parts may it, you know, has it already tried to set aside. So these are, you know, some of the things in the Middle East regarding, uh, and the, the big thing about getting out of the Middle East, there are some very big decisions looming about how do we do this? Because part, you know, some uh, in the United States and in the region would like to say the way for the United States to diminish its military involvement, particularly in the region, is to pour arms into this region, to arm its regional allies to the teeth so that they can, quote, defend themselves, unquote. You know, but we see, you know, what this has led to already, and it's become controversial. And there's a debate right now, for example, about this very large arms sale promise to the UAE after its normalization agreement with Israel. Now, just on Iran, look, the talks um, in Vienna, uh, you know, are um, concluding today, but they're going to resume, I believe, on Monday. And you know, they look to be headed in the direction of a resumption of the JCPOA. So to your question, yes, initially a, a, an initial resumption probably of a pure an agreement purely on the nuclear, Iran's nuclear program involving sanctions relief and so forth, with the idea perhaps to build on that to, to talk about its regional role. But we, we don't see any indication as of now that the agreement would be Either, either brought into other issues or lengthened in terms of time or whatever. I think what we're looking at is the United States and Iran getting back into um, an agreement, right? And things seem to be, with, with both parties basically wanting to do that, things seem to be pointed in that direction regarding regional players um, you know, the most active one right now is Israel, and there is an Israeli delegation arriving in Washington next week for, I'm sure, what will be very intensive talks, you know, following what seems to have been, um, you know, an Israeli-inspired, you know, attack on the uh, power, you know, at the Natanz facility. So, um, you know, that's going to go on, but I, I think the Biden administration is determined to get back into this agreement. Um, generally, you know, Safwan talked about, um, and you talked about, David, about differences inside uh, of course, we have a lot of differences inside the United States, inside the U.S. Congress on this issue um, regarding, you know, agreements with Iran and so forth. Less so inside the Democratic Party. There are some skeptics inside the Democratic Party. But I would say, you know, on many foreign policy issues, uh, certainly on domestic policy issues, we've seen a surprising sort of unity inside the Democratic Party between progressives and liberals in the party, more than a lot of people expected, I think, on American domestic issues. And, and that translates at least to some 
foreign policy issues. There are, you know, there are as I said, some skeptics in the Democratic Party about getting back into the JCPOA with Iran. And there are probably some more differences on the Israel issue, which perhaps we'll discuss later. David, uh, David, you're, uh, you need to unmute. <laughs> How did that happen? How, how's that? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the one, one question is, you know, how to get out. But before you even do that, um, through, let's say, various mistakes, um, the U.S. has created a bit of a vacuum in, 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 in this region. Uh, it's, it's, it's not complete, uh, uh, um, but it is sucked in uh, other players. It's sucked in Russia. Iran was already here, but, but it is given an additional protagonism. Turkey, which, which occupies a considerable part of, of, of northern Syria and is active from North Africa to the Gulf. And I'll leave the Caucasus out of this for the time. Um, then you know, uh, uh, there is simply in the case that we're, we're, we're talking about now, the Iran, this visceral past on both sides, okay? It, which, you know, incubates and encourages this, this, this antagonism and keeps it on the boil. Um, but then there are the simple practical things. I mean, from Iran's point of view, why would they trust the Americans, after so many false starts, from the first grand bargain offer under Hatami and Rasandani in the background of you know, the beginning of uh, uh, the century to 2015 and the JCPOA, in which you know, sanctions were used by the Obama administration after this deal to uh, empty the, 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 the accord of practical meaning. And there is simply quite, quite another uh, consideration here. Why, under what circumstances might Iran, which is the only country, state, uh, not, not uh, I'll leave the Kurds out of it, to, in the post-war uh, uh, era, to have been hit by weapons of mass destruction? Under what circumstances, and, and you know, the, 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 the war of the cities, the, the ballistic missiles, why would they be wanting to give up uh, uh, the, 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 the access to ballistic missiles, uh, precision or not, and, you know, forward positions uh, uh, initially conceived as a defense, not against Israel, against Iraq. Uh, um, because of the 80, 88 war. So tell me, how, how, you know, it's not just uh, how do you, how does the US, how does the Biden administration get out, but what does it leave? Uh, uh, um, and how can it go about this to, 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 to modify or, or, or rub the edges of that Iranian position, um, which has a logic? Maybe not you yours, know, maybe not ours, but David, yeah. I <laughs> let me answer your question with a question. Um, yeah. You know, just uh, you know, we saw this uh, this attack at Natanz, and um, you know, everyone immediately said, "That's it. The talks are off. Iran won't be going to the. You know, the, this is meant to torpedo." Um, the these indirect talks between the U.S. and Iran. The whole it, thing is going. It was. <laughs> it was, the yeah, Iranians yeah. showed up promptly. I mean, yeah. they need sanctions relief, right? So, um, you know, they that, also that, put the purity level of, 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 of fissile uh, nuclear material up to. Uh, of course, up to of course, the the Iranians will do. You know what what they can do to strengthen their position. We, we've seen a lot of different things, whether related to the nuclear program or related to. Um, you know, uh, attacks through proxies, uh, et cetera. They, they will do whatever they can to, to strengthen their position here. 
But I think it's clear that that they that they um, they need sanctions relief. And as I said, um, you know, even considering what happened at Natanz, things you know in Vienna seem to be the, the reports coming yeah. out are yeah. surprisingly encouraging. Yeah, David. Sorry, Karen. Uh, well, having been a uh, Guardian correspondent in Moscow in the 1990s, um, uh, if Michel you frame uh, Biden's quest as, uh, for uh, regulation of the world as a um, one between democracy, rule-based democracy and autocracy, um, I think America and the world is in for a lot more trouble. Uh, uh, Putin need not have uh, arisen or been created. I saw... Uh, uh, what Russian nationalism firsthand started bubbling up. And that was when the West was absolutely in control, of, well, totally had a perfect relationship with uh, Yeltsin. In fact, he was giving America uh, the design of his latest tank, and he was also giving America the uh, circuitry designs of the uh, wiring in the annex to the American embassy in Moscow, uh, uh, which would have been completely wired up by the KGB. That was the level of cooperation. Out of that came complete and utter a crash in the 1990s and Putin arrived. And Putin did not arrive through the Red Directors and through the Soviet Union, through the KGB. He, he arose through the, the bowels of the family, the Yeltsin family. He was an aide to Anatoly Sobchak. That's number one. Number two, um, I think events are going to steer Biden um, uh, as much as anything else. And we've seen some pretty interesting events anyway. I think it's not surprising that Iran continues with the talks because they're beautiful uh, 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 negotiators and they are, um, uh, and, and they see the strategic point. And as Michel said, they really do need the sanctions relief. I was in Tehran when uh, the Ukrainian um, uh, plane uh, got shot down and uh, I had lots of talks with people who said, ordinary Iranians who said, uh, were squeezed between our regime and America. They are desperate and desperate for relief, but they did say, and America. America was another one of their first. Um, so, and generally, I think um, if we can, if Michelle is saying that we can actually lift the sanctions because uh, the, uh, the reformists in, uh, in, in Tehran, as Michelle knows, will tell you, we did all this and we didn't get anything. We got nothing. Um, if now uh, a Biden can actually produce something, uh, I would welcome it. Uh, but I remain skeptical that, that, that real sanctions relief is, is, is on the table. But at the moment, the, the, the Iranian uh, position on this has been, uh, you lift the sanctions, we'll start lifting bit by bit. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, we'll, we'll reopen the JCPOA, but it was you who walked out the G JCPOA. And by the way, this is not America's control. This was an international treaty and you broke an international treaty with other international partners. So the, the, the line when I last was in Tehran is really quite belligerent. Whether they say that in private or, 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 uh, or, or do it, I, I, I'm not in a position to say what they're saying in, in Vienna, but it's in their position to, to uh, talk up. I would say, uh, however, that the, the JCPOA has a, is it, or just the prospect of the JCPOA um, um, uh, coming, coming together uh, does have a domino effect around the region. Maybe we can talk about that a yes. little bit later. Yes, yes, uh, yes um, absolutely. That, that is yeah. that's interesting. And there are all sorts of autocrats who uh, were very close to um, uh, Trump, but who, uh, who have had the cold shoulder from Biden are now very interested in, in, in talking to each other. There's every reason for Saudi Arabia to start talking to Iran all the way through the last four years of Trump um, they didn't. They only did it when 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 Biden turned up. And I think that's that that's interesting, and that can be leveraged by that sort of pressure. Can be leveraged by uh, the Biden administration. Um, again, when it comes to the uh, the, the sheer crescent, so called, and 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 the weakness of it, I think um, Iran does has had quite significant problems recently. 
Um, I mean, most of my information comes from Iraq on this uh, and, and, and the Shia militias, which we uh, report on in, in some detail. Uh, but the assassination of Soleimani has had really quite a uh, yeah. devastating effect on the coordination of different groups. Uh, there's competition even between the four Iranian uh, secret police, the, the Muhabarat, the, uh, some that are uh, totally controlled by Khamenei and a supreme leader, others controlled by um, uh, the, uh, the, the guards, um, and there's chaos. Um, at one point, Hezbollah uh, attempted to take that leadership role, but no one has been able to replace Soleimani, who was, who's really, uh, I mean, apart from, uh, you know, being a, a military general, was a sort of diplomatic, um, he, he was everywhere. He spoke Arabic, uh, he, uh, he had very, very good relations with, uh, or built big bridges, not just with the Kurds, but with um, the Sahwa, the, 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 the remnants of the Sahwa, the, the, the Sunni Arab leaders. He, he was a substantial figure. Now him suddenly going has, has suddenly um, uh, demonstrated the weakness of the structure. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would say yeah. Iran, Iran is very limited by um, the fact that it actually only really, can, it cannot get through to the Sunni population. It's only basically uh, dealing with, with Shia militias. But if you were to compare now uh, the position that Iran is in regionally, with the position it was in, say, in 2015, um, when you had a uh, uh, Iranian uh, deputy uh, uh, get up in the Majlis and say, we, we, we own three Arab capitals and we're just about to go into a third, into Sana. Now the situation mm -hmm. is really quite different. So we're dealing with a very, very uh, dynamic, crumbling, if you like, um, uh, uh, centrifugal situation. Okay. Sinan, um, another country um, I won't use as a cue into this, uh, uh, David's remark about certain autocrats, but um, another country which desperately needs a reset, uh, 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 and everybody concerned needs a reset, uh, uh, with the US, with the West is Turkey. Uh, uh, Erdogan's Turkey. Um, now, what do you think? I mean, a, a man who, improbably enough, uh, uh, paradoxically in some respects, uh, uh, was shielded by Trump, um, who, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think Biden has neglected to call. Uh, um, uh, so, what are the prospects for that? I mean, we've seen that Erdogan has, how can I put it, pulled in his horns a little bit, uh, uh, um, at least externally, uh, um, uh, uh, in Libya, in the East Mediterranean, in the Gulf, um, has accepted the principle of mediation with, with uh, the Saudis, um, with Egypt, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the meetings with the Greeks and so on. But, but talk to us about this. Um, thank you, David. Um, and uh, really many thanks to the Columbia Global Fund for the kind invitation. By the way, the call is happening today. Um, between Biden and Erdogan. Uh, oh. before, yeah. <laughs> Arrest <know>. my case. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, this conversation? <laughs> to, yeah, today is uh, a day before tomorrow, uh, in the sense that tomorrow is the 24th of April. So, you know, the fact that the call is happening today. Uh, may not be such a brilliant idea, um, given what Trump, oh, sorry, Biden is likely to say uh, tomorrow. So anyway, uh, it's, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, let me start, in fact, by, you know, one of your um, remarks, David, which is that, yes, uh, the Turkish um, President Erdogan has indeed developed quite a sound working relationship with Trump, which 
actually shielded uh, him and Turkey from some of the escalatory uh, paths uh, on a number of issues, uh, you know, the S-400, the Hulk Bank case and so on, which is now coming back to bite us uh, if the terminology is correct. But nonetheless, that is the reason why, you know, uh, the Turkish government uh, had been championing for a new Trump period. And therefore, there was quite a bit of disillusionment in Ankara when Trump did not win. Uh, that is also one reason where, you know, why outreach to the candidates uh, and to the democratic camp uh, was late in coming because many people in Ankara had invested in the relationship with Trump and really wanted uh, that, uh, that era to continue. So when Biden got elected, uh, the reaction in Ankara was one of trying to understand the agenda of the new president and therefore go back to the Biden speeches, you know, on his uh, during his electoral campaign. Uh, then, once the nominations became clear, try to understand, you know, what you know the, the, the Secretary of State Blinken's position would be on these issues. What you know, our former colleague with Michelle's, you know, uh, Jake Sullivan's position would be on on the core issues and so on. So there was, like I suppose many countries in the world, but more particularly for Turkey, there was a process of trying to do the homework in terms of what this new administration represents for Turkey and for the Middle East uh, more generally. One, of course, difficult uh, element of analysis was also try to evaluate in what ways this cadre who had been before in government uh, during the Obama era is actually going to implement policies uh, that are different than what we have witnessed under the Obama leadership. So uh, in what way this is going to be a continuation of the Obama years as opposed to a really new administration uh, coming on board with new ideas about what they need to do in the world and in particular in the Middle East. So when this was, you know, when, you know, uh, the Turkish side looked at this agenda, they saw some of the things that they liked and they saw some of the things that they, they disliked. Uh, let me go through, you know, through this list very quickly. On Iran, uh, of, obviously, the change was very much welcomed in Ankara because, you know, Turkey was very uneasy with the former uh, Trump policy on Iran, you know, the maximum pressure policy, which incidentally led to an anti-Iran axis uh, with, you know, Saudi, uh, Israel, UAE, Egypt, which occasionally and perhaps more than occasionally also operated as an anti-Turkey axis. So the fact that you have this new, more, you know, more nuanced Iran policy, uh, which gives weight to diplomatic negotiations, uh, was certainly welcomed in Ankara. The second element was, uh, you know, a, a bit perhaps uh, less clear, but nonetheless aspirational. And that is, you know, with the U.S. shifting its strategic focus, which is not, you know, just obviously, uh, you know, uh, something that can be said for this new administration, but it's certainly an ongoing trend away from the Middle East and towards, you know, East Asia. Uh, this would, you know, trigger an increased reliance on establishing functional relations with regional partners. And therefore, this could potentially open up scope for a country like Turkey to work together with the United States on some of the issues to the extent that the US would not want to invest as much as in the past, whether it's politically and definitely not militarily in the region. And therefore that was a second potentially positive element, uh, the way that the initial you know, remarks of the uh, Biden team was read uh, in Ankara. 
Now, on the more negative side uh, of things uh, was the focus on democracy and human rights. We obviously still don't know how the right balance, and this is obviously an eminently difficult question, but how the right balance between, you know, realpolitik and this more, you know, uh, deep attachment to turning U.S. policy on a more ethical base, uh, on more, you know, human rights, uh, fundamental freedoms will actually work. Now, the first test was with regard to Saudi Arabia and that, you know, the new administration may not have passed that test with colors in colors uh, after uh, allowing, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the post verdict on, on the Kashyyyk uh, incident. Uh, so it's, it's still, you know, an open question how this more, and I think, you know, very uh, commendable and, uh, but, difficult devotion to incorporating uh, this um, ethical norms in U.S. foreign policy, also for reasons that have to do with the U.S. on domestic orders, obviously, uh, is going to work in practice in the Middle East. That remains an open question, but it is a risky endeavor uh, for Turkey, given where uh, Turkey's own track record stands in terms of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. So the less stress on these elements, the better it is uh, for uh, the current uh, Turkish leadership. Um, and, um, and finally, uh, perhaps on the negative uh, scorecard, just don't, you know, do not to monopolize time, is the US policy on Syria, and particularly what's going to happen to the relationship with the Syrian you know, PYD, YPG. This is not, this is a policy that's been, you know, at the root of, uh, you know, a great degree of toxicity in the bilateral relationship. Uh, it's one of the, you know, core dynamics that have tended to fuel anti-Americanism in Turkey. So there was, a, there was, there is, there is therefore, there was therefore a lot of interest in trying to understand what the new administration uh, will do on Syria to what extent its policy will be different uh, from uh, the Trump era. So far, the messaging on the US side is one of continuity. Uh, that, you know, this policy is not being put into question despite its very negative, you know, implications for the bilateral relationship. Now, looking at this, you know, at this picture in Washington, what is it that Turkey tried to do? exactly what you said. We, we certainly have witnessed a major effort to recalibrate Turkish foreign policy that's driven by two things. One is, you know, Trump, uh, Biden instead of Trump. So adjusting to US policy under Biden. But the other one is more internal and that has to do with the Turkish economy. I think there has been a belated acknowledgement and realization in Ankara that the very combative, aggressive foreign policy of years past was inimical and did not really comply, uh, was not congruent with the expectations of trying to redress uh, Turkey's economic performance. That finally did sunk in. So that's been partially, that's what's driving this, you know, charm offensive. It's not just Biden. There's also the need to redress the economy that's driving the charm offensive, but it's also Biden. And uh, to what extent this is going to be successful is an open question because Turkey is doing this charm offensive actually from a weak negotiating position. And we see this very clearly from the reactions that the Turkish government is receiving from, particularly from Egypt, because those countries are looking at Turkey, I would argue, and realizing that this is, you know, this has been a shift that's been forced upon the Turkish government for the two reasons that I've mentioned. And therefore, they are now, you know, remain more maximalist in their positions in a wait and see mode, trying to put a menu of expectations, uh, you know, in the, in the case of Egypt, obviously, it has a lot to do with 
you know, what happens to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and, and basically awaiting the, the, for the Turkish government to deliver on these issues. Uh, and finally, of course, a lot of this, whether this shift readjustment will succeed, will also depend on the future of the bilateral relationship with Washington. And there, unfortunately, the near term is likely to be, you know, ever more turbulent uh, with, you know, possibly an announcement by the president tomorrow on the events of 1915, and then the Halkbank. Just to be clear, the yeah, the Armenian genocide is, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I'm not putting words in your mouth. Um, thank you, Sinan. Um, just picking up what you were saying about uh, Biden failing the, the, the Hashoji test, as it were. But the Biden effect has arguably been felt most so far, well, by two people. And we'll go through them. First, Mohammed bin Salman, you know, the, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, it's day to day ruler, um, who has been offering a series of having put all his, his eggs in the Trump basket, Trump Kushner basket, um, has been offering a serial expiatory, off, you know. Offerings to 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 the Biden administration, Qatar, uh, 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 restraining oil production, uh, releasing some prisoners, uh, beginning talks with the Iranians, and so on. We we could find in, innumerable examples. Um, how is that likely to develop, Michel? May I come back to you? Yeah, the um, look, I think, you know, the Biden administration, um, this was this was one of the Middle East issues they took on, um, you know, right from the beginning, they had made a campaign promise that they were going to make public this intelligence report that identified Mohammed bin Salman as having been behind the Khashoggi murder. Um, and they did so. Uh, uh, then the question was, you know, what were they going to do about it. So what they decided, of course, as we saw, was that they would um, they would do they would do three things. One of which I don't think has gotten much attention. One of them was to uh, impose some sanctions on on Saudis uh, that were related to either the Khashoggi uh, killing or other actions against Saudi dissidents abroad and so forth. The second one that got a lot of attention was not to sanction Mohammed bin Salman himself. They, the Biden administration seemed to have decided, and one can argue with this, but at least this was their assessment, that, that Mohammed bin Salman is going to come to the throne in Saudi Arabia and that it would be imprudent on their part to um, you know, to, to take such strong action against him at this point. They, 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 and the third thing was, I mean, they sort of decided to give him a chance, so to speak, but they made this very stern statement uh, about how the United States, you know, will not tolerate further action against Saudi dissidents abroad or something like that. So they've taken a kind of gamble here that um, Mohammed bin Salman's, you know, is going to, change his mode of behavior, at least to some extent, um, so that, it, you know, it, and, and that it will somehow, you know, his behavior, whether uh, uh, in so many ways, will somehow be more um, acceptable to the United States and to the global community. I think that's a big gamble. I mean, we, we really don't know if that will be the case. Um, Past yes, experience see, would suggest that, in Amman here. <laughs> yeah, past experience would suggest that going no, to shave. you know. Um, I you know, and there and 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 um you know, and, and then if if uh if Mohammed bin Salman does return, you know, in some ways, whether towards Saudi dissidents or maybe it could be any number of issues to the kind of reckless and brutal behavior we've seen on his part up till now, um. I think that's going to face the Biden administration with a really difficult situation, you know, how, how to deal with that, because they did, I think, sort of set up the expectation that, okay, we're giving you a chance here, but, um, you know, we're not giving you a free pass, 
So we'll see how it goes. Okay, we need we need to push on uh, with topics because uh, we're we're otherwise going to run out of time. Another um, not not one of Biden's most favorite people because he's known him far too long, uh, Netanyahu. Um, uh, now, difficult one. I, I, Biden is an unexceptionable uh, pro-Israel Democrat in, 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 in the most mainstream sense. Who would uh, surely push back against unilateral annexation, not least because it encourages other people to, to you know, from Moscow to Beijing, to Delhi, to Ankara, to indulge in land grabs. Uh, 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 um, not, not an awfully useful precedent. Um, it would also set up as the only alternative, one which I believe we're, I, I think we're already there, um, a single state rather than the two state solution in which Palestinians would rather like uh, South Africans before them, the South African majority, black majority before them would uh, uh, have to fight for equal rights and the land between the river and the sea. Now, at the same time, you know, uh, what would he or, or and, and his colleagues object to an expansion of the so-called Abraham Accords? And if so, on what grounds? I mean, I think personally, but I, I put it over to you straight away. I mean, not an expansion at any cost, um, including uh, uh, as we've seen in, in the events of recent weeks, the squeezing of Jordan and the Hashemites, which the House of Saud is, and you know, uh, spearheaded currently by Mohammed bin Salman, has clearly uh, uh, identified and tried to weaponize, uh, uh, seizing from the Hashemites the custodianship of Jerusalem to add to the 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 guardianship of Mecca and Medina that his grandfather took from the Hashemites in 1925. So. This uh, 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 Biden, it seems to me, as Safan pointed out, has put down a marker on this by making his first call to an Arab leader to King Abdullah of Jordan. Uh, um, so on that broad problematic of how you deal with, with uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, but, but, but as concrete as possible, please, um, at a time when I think you, Michelle, have pointed out there is a debate inside the Democratic Party about being more rigorous about conditionality on Israeli behavior uh, uh, um, and the creeping annexation of, of, of the West Bank, which aims eventually to, 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 to arrive at the old proposition that the Palestinians already have a state, it's called Jordan and therefore set off a third wave of refugees across the river, which would destabilize the kingdom of Jordan. Um, David, your turn, I think. I think- um, And anybody else after. I, I, I absolutely agree that this is a, a really, the essential uh, uh, question. Basically, Israel has vis-a-vis -vis not just this administration, but uh, previous administrations, including Republican administrations, uh, behaved with impunity. Um, that um, uh, yes, yes. they have, mm -hmm. uh, they are the tail that's wagging the dog. They um, uh, uh, have gone forward with their agenda, which is basically to fill up the, uh, the West Bank with settlements, 600,000 uh, settlers there. Um, and I think personally, um, that the two-state solution has, is a train that has left the station has gone. Um, and, um, and, and possibly even very optimistically, you could then say the landing stage uh, at the end, possibly of another war uh, or of another intifada would be somewhere between uh, a two-state solution and a one-state solution. You, you, you could be optimistic about some sort of confederation or whatever, but we're nowhere near there yet. Uh, where we are at the moment is, is uh, 
you know, right-wing supporters of an Israeli football club uh, chanting death to the Arabs. That's where we are. Um, and, um, um, and, um, uh, and, and you've got Netanyahu who can't form a new government. Um, you've got the tribes of Israel fighting each other. It, it's an extremely difficult situation in which to start negotiating some sort of, uh, you know, high-minded view of let's treat the Palestinians as, as people. Uh, as 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 in, and not try and push them somewhere uh, all the time, and also the Trump effect that that, that actually that has had a has had an effect in the sense that America has lost um, uh, its uh, the the tag on its uh, table of being an independent negotiator. I think fewer people in Palestine now view, view America as the impartial referee, which it did assume under Clinton. Uh, and the Camp David Accords and, 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 and thereafter. I think that has happened. The other thing is that there are a lot of things from Trump that Biden have accepted. Biden is not going to, to, to declassify, pull out of Jerusalem. Um, and I asked a, a Biden... To reverse uh, it, no, no. I asked a Biden man uh, two years ago in London, uh, what would you change? He said, we're not going to change that. Uh, they're not going to change the Golan Heights. Um, they're not, you know, the, the, the whole series of things that, 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 maybe I'm wrong, Michelle, but, but you were doubting it, but I think, I think that's going to go ahead as well. I mean, it has gone ahead. So de facto, all Israel has to do is allow the continuing sort of gradual salami slice settlement practice to go ahead and the situation becomes more and more and more uh, difficult. Um, uh, so it, if this is why I'm really interested in Michelle's comments about uh, a, a real success of the uh, JCPOA, and uh, if sanctions are lifted, and if Biden stares down Israel, who says we don't want you to do it, and he says I will do it, that would be for me that would be progress. If actually America stared Israel down and didn't supply it with arms, didn't didn't, and actually, I think one of the main challenges with America is the behavior of its allies, not its enemies. Its enemies are a little bit more logical. Its allies are, have got all sorts of plans. Um, they want to become hegemons. Originally, this started in 2013. We said, right, it's the Brotherhood who's the, the, the real problem. It's political Islam. It's Al Qaeda. They're all the same thing. We're going to fight them. And a lot of people in the West swallow that. Now, I think people are much, much more skeptical. It's not about political Islam. It's not about some existential threat to democracy in the least. It's about hegemony. It's about power. And um, MBS and MBZ, his, his mentor, Mohammed bin Zayed, are about establishing a regional power with Israel as, it, as, as, uh, as its partner. And if, unfortunately, uh, uh, his plans have succeeded in Jordan. I think Jordan would very soon have become a sort of Bahrain. I put, I put it as strongly as that. I think, I think Jordan's fight is for its own sovereignty under this huge pressure coming of for, for the money. I'm not confident myself that, that King Abdullah will resist uh, the King's shilling or rather, you know, the King's dinar or the Crown Prince's dinar. But um, very much there are huge things at stake going on in, uh, uh, in, in Jordan, which is why I wrote the column to say that I, I think it's absolutely right for Biden to, to, to support King Abdullah, even though there are big, big problems with governance. The other problem, I think, which is really difficult here, is that the Middle East is a much, much weaker place than it was in, say, 2011, in terms of foreign debt, in terms of poverty, in terms of water resources, in terms of the economy. So that if you let the situation just carry on, carry on, carry on, um, you're heading for a, a, a brick wall. Coming back to Israel, um, if you let Israel carry on and bully everyone and bully you, bully Washington, um, uh, you're, you're going straight into, a, in, 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 into a, a brick wall. So very, very much, I'm really interested in, in um, Biden quietly behind the scenes, giving markers to Israel to say, no, this is our foreign policy. This is our uh, relationship. We have an interest. You have your, your interests, your relationship. But I mean, if you just think of what, uh, what has happened in Iran over, and I'm citing the um, 
excellent article by them. This is not my journalism. This is uh, New York Times um, uh, saying that, you know, in, just in the past nine months, um, we've had uh, 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 two assassinations in, uh, um, uh, in, in, in Iran. We've had two explosions. Um, and Israel has done very, very little to deny responsibility for uh, these assassinations. So on the one hand, you have uh, the, the leader of the free world, uh, America, talking to Iran. On the other hand, you have Israel uh, with a very, very uh, clear and strong uh, assassination campaign. And I'm not even mentioning all the planes that fly over your head, David, every day uh, hitting uh, uh, you know, Iranian targets in, in Syria. Israel is not behaving militarily as if it is under any constraints. So just applying that break to Israel would be an enormous um, sign that America really is back. Okay, so part of the me, David, if I may, um, I mean, I'd love to get Michelle's uh, view on this. I mean, as you can imagine, lots of the questions in the Q&A that are coming from the audience uh, have to do with Israel-Palestine. I think, David, you've addressed uh, some of those questions, uh, and I agree with you mm -hmm. that the peace process um, is that, right? I mean, the peace process, the way that we have thought about it in terms of a two-state uh, solution. Uh, the politics of Israel are increasingly complicated. You know, you talk to people on the ground, and it's very unlikely that Netanyahu will be able to form a government. Uh, you know, will Saar and Bennett and, and, and others come? in and, um, you know, united by their animosity towards uh, Netanyahu, what might that mean? Uh, but Michelle, I mean, you know, a lot of questions are about the um, uh, skepticism, I think in your remarks, you talked about skepticism within Washington regarding Israel, right? I mean, something that 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, those of us who spent time in America, I'm an American, you know, we wouldn't have even, um, thought uh, is possible. Um, do you, I mean, there are questions about sort of, you know, that polarization also within the Democratic Party. Um, how will that impact foreign policy? I mean, you know, we know where Biden <laughs> is, you know, his history. Um, how will he navigate uh, these things? And perhaps even related to that, uh, do you, how do you see rallying support uh, behind the JCPA or uh, POA within um, within the the, uh, the within Congress. Sorry, David Gardner. No, no, no. Please, 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 please channel the question. Okay, so you know, I, I mentioned before that I think um, in the Biden administration, you know, they've been sort of sorting out what the Trump administration left them in the Middle East, and that's definitely the case on this file uh, related to Israel. So, you know, as we've seen, certain things that uh, President Trump did that were broadly popular, uh, it, certainly in the U.S. Congress, the change of policy on Jerusalem, as well as the normalization agreements by Arab states with Israel, you know, Biden expressed um, support for those things even during the campaign, and it was clear that he wasn't going to change them. Um, I do think that uh, I think it was what you, David Gardner, indicated that the. While, the, while I think the, the Biden administration is open to more normalization agreements, um, I don't think they'll pursue them as avidly as the Trump administration did, you know, as a major foreign policy achievement. And I certainly don't think they will be as, um, you know, free with, with giving away gifts in, in exchange for them as, as yeah. Trump was. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, some of the things uh, I think David Hurst mentioned, for example, the, the U.S. recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, as well as uh, Moroccan control of the Western Sahara. These are things that there, there have been some sort of quiet indications. I don't think the Biden administration is going to rush out to change those things, but they've sort of indicated that, well, you know, they're a little, little concerned about the implications of those moves, and they might be open to reversing them uh, depending on the circumstances. I mean, for example, on Golan, 
in the in the unlikely event that there were some possibility of peace between Israel and Syria. So um, I think some of those things are sort of questioned. But just to get to this issue uh, about the debate inside the United States, you know, there's a very interesting thing that happened in Washington last week, which was the con the conference of this organization called J Street. You know, yes. as we all know, for many years back, you know, for decades, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, really dominated uh, American domestic politics as it pertained to policy toward Israel. Then in 2007, this organization, J Street, which was sort of more liberal, which pro proclaimed itself to be pro-Zionist, but also pro-peace, uh, started, it started very small. And by now in 2021, it has grown to be a very significant um, organization. Um, you know, it, it gives a lot of support to congressional campaigns and so forth. Now, major figures, all Democrats, you know, uh, spoke at the J, J Street conference and they did two things at the conference which were really interesting. Uh, one was that they actually supported a move by a Democratic member of Congress, a bill that she put forward calling for uh, conditioning U.S. aid to Israel to, to ensure that uh, U.S. aid is not spent in ways that harm Palestinian human rights, particularly there was a lot of emphasis in the bill on the rights of children uh, being detained, beaten, et cetera. So uh, J Street supported that bill, which was um, surprising. The other thing they did was to, uh, they, they've been long advocates of the two-state solution to say that, well, maybe it's time now uh, to discuss, and they did discuss at the conference, uh, whether there would need to be not, not two totally distinct states, but some sort of confederation. This, let me note, not involving Jordan, but between a Palestinian and an Israeli state. Uh, that was a move, you know? And so what we're seeing is, you know, the conversation is changing, but it's still very hot, you know, in, a in, a, in reaction to, to this bill that was put forward on conditioning Israeli aid, which will go nowhere legislatively. There was, you know, a letter by three quarters of the members of the House of Representatives saying they're not in favor of any conditions, uh, you know, on aid to Israel. Um, so there's a very big back and forth. And part of it, it, it's, it becomes highly domestic too. There's a real argument inside the United States on the definition of anti-Semitism. Um, this is kind of being fought out state by state and whether, um, you know, whether criticism of the state of Israel or um, support for boycott divestment sanctions, you know, against Israel, whether those should be considered anti-Semitism within the United States. This is largely, I would say, you know, an argument that's going on in inside democratic circles, but it shows you that things have really changed. I mean, they're, you know, it's, it, it's not going to lead to a wholesale change in U.S. administration policy or in legislation at this time. But we're seeing, you know, public opinion and opinion, you know, among Democratic members, at least, of Congress. There's a much broader range of opinion on this Israel-Palestine issue that is discussed now than was, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, there's a lot of interest, of course, in uh, in Jordan and in the changing role of Jordan. Uh, Rana Suez, uh, who I think is from the New York Times, said uh, to David would know better, is asking about how the regional role of Jordan has been changing. Um, others are asking, you know, how um, is the United States and the Biden administration likely to um, continue to bolster Jordan's um, role regionally, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian issue, vis-a-vis -vis other things that are going on? I was struck by your remark, David, um, and I hope um, that we never see this, that Jordan becomes another Bahrain in terms of its relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, so I wonder if we can 
take this dimension and uh, elaborate on it um, a little bit uh, further. How do we see the changes in the role of Jordan regionally and you know historically and where it is now and what's what's likely to uh, to happen? Is that for me? Yes, I think so. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I'm very sympathetic to Jordan uh, and 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 to the Hashemites. I think um, uh, it does bear the weight of history, um, uh, and uh, it has tried to negotiate. Um, I was very very struck by talking to um, another. Um, um, colleague of yours at uh, uh, Carnegie, uh, uh, Maran Moasha, who is the first Jordanian um, ambassador to Israel, and what he actually thought uh, of, of mm -hmm. what he tried to do. Um, he gave me a very long interview, I think, two years ago. Uh, I think it's now still up on the Carnegie, Carnegie site, um, where he was, he was despairing. He, he, he basically said he, he was one of the authors of the Arab Peace Initiative, and uh, he thought it was a fair offer, and really, you know, Israel did nothing with it, nor really did America, um, and and he despaired um, uh, of this. And, but I think Jordan has had a uh, a role, which 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 is a very important role as a peacemaker, as as a buffer state, and as uh, uh, with so many refugees in, in there as well. I don't think um, we've ever given Jordan the credit for the sheer number of refugees that it, 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 it contains. And it, even, the, even the Syrian, I went to the Syrian camps, um, con considering that one million um, uh, uh, Syrian refugees caused so many problems to Germany. And you, you, you think of how many Jordan has taken, um, an infinitesimally uh, poorer country. Um, I, I, um, uh, I, I see Jordan as the classic victim of blue sky thinking of, 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 of the Trump administration. Um, they basically ignored it. Um, and um, you ignore Jordan at your peril. Uh, I, I think Netanyahu ignores Jordan at his peril. I think it would be absolutely in Netanyahu's interest to reestablish a proper relationship with Abdullah. Their relationship is very, very bad. We, we all know about, you know, the embassy shootings. I mean, it, 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 it it went back to that. Um, uh, uh, however, there are there are more far-sighted people in Israel that the security establishment and the intelligence establishment who who tear their hair out and say Netanyahu is doing absolutely the wrong thing. If it really wants to weaken its its safest and longest border, that's exactly what you, what, what you do. So there is a real question of uh, of um, the security of Jordan. And, and its importance historically for, for the Palestinian position. Having said that, I think Jordan is suffering from exactly the same uh, problems as, 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 as other monarchies are uh, uh, in the Middle East, and that is bad governance. It is, it is uh, uh, particularly, um, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, from from shown up by the COVID um, and 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 the virus uh, uh, going on, um, Jordan has found itself internationally um, displaced by the Abraham Accords, um, and that you have uh, the second wave of normalisation basically dominating and bullying the first wave of normalisation, and the same is true partially of Egypt as well. That again uh, was the victim of this so-called blue sky thinking um, of, of, of Trump and his son-in-law. Um, so my, my position is there's a lot to lose in Jordan and actually people haven't, actually it's only when it's lost that people would actually find out that they need someone like Jordan to, to, to exist. We do not want Jordan to, um, to, uh, to crumble. Um, absolutely not in the thinking either of King Salman or his son who have absolutely no feelings for the place. His brothers did, um, and, and they, they had good relationships, uh, you know, uh, before King Abdul had a good, uh, a, a, good, a good relationship with Jordan. I think it's personal, it's willful, and to respond to, to, to Michelle's comment about, about from, from Biden about Khashoggi, I don't think there's any evidence that, that Mohammed bin Salman um, uh, gets the message. 
May, may I just make make a couple of remarks related to that, um, so far. That, um, it's, it's very curious, I mean, picking up on Netanyahu's attitude towards Jordan, which there's a long history, as we know, but, and, and it'd be interesting to figure out what is behind his uh, 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 willingness to risk what for Israel is, 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 is a pretty priceless strategic asset uh, um, that, I mean, you know, people say, well, you know, takes it for granted and so I think there's a lot more than that, a lot more than that. It's, um, I think it goes back to, I mean, we need to recall that the first term, 9699 of Netanyahu, was when he, uh, uh, ordered the assassination of Halim Mesha. And we, we know what happened there. Uh, um, this was a week after uh, uh, the late King Hussein had given Netanyahu an offer from Hamas of a 30 year truce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, and, you know, the King said, it's like he just spat in my face. Uh, um, it's, these people have an attitude uh, uh, by these people. Let me be clear. That side of the Israeli house, the, the irredentist side of the Israeli house, has this Jordan is Palestine attitude. OK, I, and this has been bubbling up again. And now I think what the difference is that he looks he looks south and sees, hmm, it's no longer Abdullah, it's, it's Muhammad bin Salman. Um, you know, the, this, and it's no longer Sheikh Zayed, it's Enbi uh, um, Unlike their forebears, these guys have absolutely no sense of or emotional engagement or any kind of baggage whatsoever involving the Palestinians, okay? They just want to bulldoze the whole thing uh, um, and, you know, get on with it. And he said, you know, it, it, it is just right for everything that we have been saying to push ahead and pursue it. Therefore, it, it, they, they just don't see, it seems to me, that there is risk involved measured against reward. Uh, um, that, that, that's my view. It, it isn't a simple matter of, oh, they take it for granted. No, I don't think so. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, and for Netanyahu, that's it's the question. And for Netanyahu, it's ideological, isn't it? I mean, you know, his, oh, of course. his of course. revisionist of course. Uh, Zionism informed by his of father, um, yeah, who yeah. worked with Jabotinsky, and, you know, that, yeah, that yeah. leads him. And for MBS, as David said, um, you know, his brothers um, had a very different take on relationships and familial relationships and tribal relationships in a way that he as a disruptor um, has no regard for. Um, so this, you know, brings up, and I want to bring in Sinan also because, uh, you know, um, Turkey and its position vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, everything here that we're, uh, we're talking about. Um, you know, how do you see Turkey calculating sort of its influence within the region? You know, it's been quiet on a number of these fronts. It's been very focused on, um, on Syria. Uh, but anything that you would like to observe on what you've been um, hearing? Let me perhaps start on the uh, Israeli side. Uh, well, Palestine um, question because obviously of relevance to Jordan as well, uh, because until quite recently, uh, the more you know um, ambitious, perhaps aggressive Turkish foreign policy's main tenets was to defend uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, and uh, and certainly do not shy away. Uh, from, you know, a, a rhetorical battle with the Israeli leadership. So um, it would be interesting to see to what extent this, you know, ongoing process of recalibration 
uh, which uh, also encompasses Israel. And there's been, for the first time for many years, uh, to my understanding, an invitation issued to the Israeli Minister of Energy to attend an event uh, in, in Antalya in June. Uh, to what extent this rapprochement uh, with Israel is going to impact uh, Turkish you know, stance or posturing on the Palestinian issue? Uh, because obviously, when we look at the, you know, at the, at the, um, you know, a decade ago, the way that Turkey had positioned itself uh, at the time when, you know, the foreign minister was Abdullah Gül was to be an interlocutor. So uh, Turkey was actually one of the few countries that acted that was that had was able to engage the Israeli leadership had very good relations with the Palestinian leadership, and therefore, you know, did play uh, a, you know, a, a role uh, in order to at least protect uh, Palestinian uh, freedoms um, and uh, uh, before Israel. Now, of course, that was lost, uh, you know, after Turkey switched totally and, and broke relations uh, almost with Israel. And therefore, you know, whether in the near future, Turkey can reacquire that position of being, you know, a trusted partner, uh, not, not so much as part of the, you know, the quartet or the official, uh, you know, the uh, policy initiatives, but at least on the sidelines, because that was the role in the past. Um, so to what, to whether if this recalibration succeeds, and that will also depend on, you know, what happens in Israel, obviously. But if this relative recalibration succeeds, I think that would be to the benefit of the whole region in the sense of Turkey reacquiring this position uh, of being, you know, uh, at least a trusted intermediary for both parties in areas where that role might make a difference. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't mean that Turkey will have a role to play across the board regarding the Middle East peace process, that's not what I mean, but there have been cases in the past but when that role was useful uh, and both parties relied on, you know, on Ankara to uh, engage in some indirect dialogue. Um, that, I think, if Turkey can return to that space, uh, that would be useful both, I think, for Israel and for Palestinians. Thank you. Some, uh, some of the uh... Turkey's uh, gains, if, 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 if uh, from Ankara's point of view, and a projection of um, Turkish foreign policy from, I mean, Turkish foreign policy wasn't in the Middle East for, for a very, very long time, because it's now a Middle East power, is to do with the use of arms. It's to do with Turkish drones. Um, it's to do with having effectively uh, uh, pushed Haftar uh, back from, from, from Tripoli, which is why uh, Egypt, I mean, there's another reason apart from uh, the, the domino effect we were talking about before of why Egypt is talking to Turkey at, at uh, intelligence level and then at foreign minister level, and that's over Libya. Um, and, and Turkey imposed itself in the same way that Russia did in, in, in Syria and has pushed back, pushed back against Haftar and the UAE, and, and, and it's forced with force. Now, for, for, for liberals like me, this is an irony because we all talked about peacefulness. Um, you know, the peaceful um, Arab Spring and the rest of it, uh, which was crushed by force. But in fact, one, one antidote, one reason why Turkey is in a position system is because it has used force. It's used force in Libya. Yeah, it's hard, hard. Yeah. Can, can I just react very quickly from what I heard from David? I think that's a very good point, And it, it really demonstrates, you know, <coughs> part of Turkey's growing influence. The criticism, and it's a bit of a criticism of the Russian position in Syria as well, is that you know the success that you have with hard power, whether you have the diplomatic ability to translate this into lasting gain, gains, yeah. you know, and you know that's Russia's stumbling block in Syria as well, and to to some extent Turkey's stumbling block in Libya. Uh, that, you know, the, how do you actually once, you know, how do you translate your hard power influence into diplomatic gains? Uh, that's, that's what I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to react uh, to set uh, to the table. 
David Gardner. For, for instance, it was, it, 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 sorry. It, it was sure. interesting that, that Turkey and Egypt agreed not only on the winning ticket for the Libyan uh, government, but also the losing ticket as well. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So as, as, as we reach the end of this incredibly, as, as I promised at the beginning, that this was going to be a riveting discussion and one that could go on uh, for hours and days. And every time we think that the uh, Middle East um, could perhaps become a little bit less uh, complex, of course, uh, it gets exponentially uh, more complex. So. David uh, Gardner, I'm going to turn it over to you to um, close it and maybe give everybody a chance to, um, you know, give their uh, closing thoughts. And may I ask, maybe challenge us all um, to think about something and share something hopeful and positive about this region going forward. I know we often have to think hard to... Um, to come up with something, but but it would be great if we could um, end you, on you, it. You time. ask a lot, Safran. You ask I know, a lot. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, look, let's let's just pick through the debris a bit and see if you can't get to something resembling reconstruction. Uh, uh, um, you. Let's stand back, okay? The, 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 uh, one of the, the, the problems exercising this region is that Iran um, capitalizing on the mistakes is very, Iran has always been extremely lucky in its enemies. Um, capitalizing on their serial mistakes from, you know, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, I, you know, the, 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 the absolute fecklessness of subcontracting support for the, the Syrian rebellion to Turkey and the Gulf and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, it built what it is pleased to call, and Beda mentioned that they, that they actually said we control four capitals and so on, this sheer axis of power, um, you know, from the Caspian to the Mediterranean, um, the so-called, you know, Shia corridor and so on, but looked at it in another light, I mean, you know, across the Levant, which is a problem for the region, which will irradiate chaos unless it's, um, an attempt is made to come to grips with it. You know, you have Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, this is not an arc, an axis of power. It's an arc of failed states, which um, Iran increasingly struggles to manage, especially, I think you, David, mentioned, post uh, Qasem Soleimani. I mean, you know, the attempt to subcontract that to uh, Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah, I mean, sorry, not going to work, not going to work. Uh, uh, um, it's... It's not possible to proceed purely on that uh, uh, hard power formula of militias and missiles. And uh, I think you, Michelle, said, um, you know, the need for sanctions relief is very, very pressing indeed. Uh, um, so does the rapprochement, the series of initiatives that we've talked about, um, uh, you know, Vienna, Baghdad, etc. Um, can that lead you to a position where, you know, rapprochement leads to win win reconstruction formulas for the region in which the North, the Levant, is partly, uh, the, it, it, it's, it's reconstruction is partly financed by a Gulf. A, 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 a very, you know, cash-rich Gulf, um, which is also seeking, uh, uh, for the first time in, in the history of oil, to diversify away from oil, to create a new future for its people. Um, and we're talking vast amounts here. I mean, conceivably, 
you know, three trillion in reconstruction and unmet investment needs. So, I mean, I, I'd invite you to consider that. And also in terms, just one final thing, in terms of the vacuum, the partial vacuum left by a US which is half in, half out. Uh, um, you know, it's, we, we always used to think of, of Russia and before it, the Soviet Union as unable to construct anything, but, but, but very able to play the role of spoiler. In recent years, it, it is, you know, the, the idea has gained hold that actually Russia is more reliable than the US. Um, this is principally because of Syria, but not solely. We can't go you know, step by step in that. But there must be a robust and withering response to that. What is it? Michelle. All right. Well, I will give uh, I will actually give two hopeful thoughts, one short term and one long term. The short term one is um, it's a good moment for diplomacy. Let's not waste yes. it. We see everyone talking to everyone, uh, and you know, in terms of you know, what is the what is the answer to uh, Russia? I mean, yes, Russia is reliable, rely a reliably malign actor. Um, you know, I mean, what what I think, as I said at the beginning, you know, what what President Biden is trying to reassert after you know the very difficult Trump era is. Um, you know, is, is, you know, what, what kind of, um, you know, what, what kind of world the United States stands for. And it's not the unipolar moment anymore. Okay. We, I don't know if that even needs saying anymore. So, okay. Hopeful thought one, you know, short term, it's a good moment for diplomacy. Everyone's talking to everyone. Let's not waste it. There, there, you know, there is an opportunity to make some real headway on some of the really difficult situations in the region. The second one is related to something else you just said, David, as well. The looming end of the oil and gas era. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to, and we we see the I see different effects of it every day. The the bad news is in the short term, in the coming years, it's going to throw this region into turmoil. In the longer run, what the region has is the opportunity to build productive economies based primarily on human capital and technology and green energy, and to, to build the kind of governing systems that will be necessary to support those kind of economies. So, you know, it, I think that oil has been the blessing and the curse of this region. That curse is lifting. But there, it's a huge challenge. I mean, if you read the International Monetary Fund reports, which I do closely, they're really ringing the alarm bells that uh, the countries in this region and especially the countries of the Gulf are far behind where they should be in diversifying their economies. So that's the thing. And by the way, just to leave it again with US policy, I think that whole big, uh, basket of issues of how that's going to affect the Middle East and how the United States and others in, in the international community need to engage with this region to encourage it to make that difficult transition to the post oil era. That's something that I don't see the Biden administration thinking about at this point. Sinan. Just to follow up on me, what Michelle said, because she basically looked at, you know, uh, from the region's perspective. But I think the second chapter to what she said relates to the West. And if we indeed do see this rather more positive scenario about the future of the region, which is, you know, enmeshed with, you know, the green transformation then the West also has to do something. And that's really about, you know, how do you both incentivize, but also provide more financial opportunities and funding for this transition to happen. Um, and uh, this is uh, a, you know, a policy objective that indeed might be taken on board both by the EU, now that it has a more ambitious agenda, the Green Deal agenda, 
but also possibly by the US with its return to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and we may, if, you know, if we really want to be positive about it, uh, be optimistic that some of this uh, will be tabled at the uh, conference of participants meetings in Glasgow this year uh, about climate change. And the second part of a potentially positive message may have to do with COVID because we haven't talked about it at all today. But I think, you know, this is a region like many others, but perhaps even more so being affected by, you know, uh, by the uh, ec economic shock and the social shock of COVID, which comes on top of already, you know, a large, uh, you know, a large set of vulnerabilities. So that's more reason to think that, you know, there will be an even more need for a true rebound if these, you know, if these governments are due to remain in power. And that also, you know, calls for more uh, stable policies, better governance and international cooperation. Just the need to overcome these vulnerabilities that have further been entrenched by COVID. So if you're able on one, in order to end on a more positive note, David. Thank you, Senator. David? Yeah, well, I, I, I would say the, the primary task uh, of, of uh, Biden should be deconfliction uh, uh, in the Middle East. That's not necessarily being soft on everyone. It's been tougher, as I hinted before, on your allies. I don't know how F-35s are started, whether they have a car key or not, but take away a few of the car keys, um, you know, make it slightly more difficult for people to use the technology that you're given if they don't comply with what you're doing. I'm sure there's an awful lot of technology exchange going on and it's and, and these things are not just a, a simple thing. So use those levers, use those levers with your allies if they're doing, uh, doing the wrong thing and put your money in areas, not in arms sales, but in areas which are needed. Tunisia needs a huge amount of money um, you know, you only have to go away from the coastline, find out where Al Qaeda and ISIS recruited. Um, well, they, were, they, they came from drug dealers. They were recruiting. Uh, they, they were they were given thought. Cut those cut those lines of supply off by doing the right thing with your money because we have got money. I mean, the central problem of the Middle East, and I'm not anti-West. You know, I'm not all anti-American or and or this or. You know, I, I simply not. Um, the, I, although I'm, I'm very, very cynical about uh, democracy promotion, which in Eastern Europe has achieved its opposite. Um, but um, I would say that really um, concentrate on the areas that, of behavior that, that you can actually affect and, and, and be at people's sides when you need them. Or when they need you, supply vaccines, supply uh, money, um, uh, um, uh, and and that would be a, a far, a much more practical, hands-on foreign policy in that sense, and a much more immediate foreign policy, and less ideologically driven uh, foreign policy, would be a much more practical benefit to people uh, than all the grandstanding about uh, being leaders of the free world. Beautiful. Diplomacy and investment, right? And the right kind of investment. And the right Sorry, kind of what, 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 the, the, the thought I was going to say, and I sort of slightly interrupted myself, is that the, the problem of the Arab Spring has was that the people were in one place and the money was in the other. Right. Uh, and actually what you really do need to, to, to solve the problem of 2000, we haven't talked about it, of 2011, we all agree is still going on that the the elements are still going on is to marry the money up with the people yeah and get that to build, build up social system. capital yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely so instead yeah. of having Mohammed bin salman lecturing boris johnson and saying i want to buy newcastle united why don't you invest in why don't you invest in pakistan why do you invest in egypt why do you invest in people in lebanon in jordan invest in jordan that's my optimistic thought and what a beautiful note to end on. David Gardner, anything to add? No, I'll leave it to you, Safwan. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank that you. That was a, a, Thank you. an extremely interesting conversation.
which, which we could go on with, uh, um, perhaps break out a bottle of something and, and, and you know, continue. But hey, um, there will be other occasions. And they thank you, Safan, for inviting us. Thank you thank for you. inviting us. Very good conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you Michelle. all very, very, very much. Really rich, rich insights and very grateful. And I know our audience is very, very grateful for everything that they have heard. Look forward to doing more together.